tomorrow, I guess. And so we wish you happy birthday, and we hope that you have a great week. Uh, and we are thankful for all you give and do for your family and also for us here at Lupo. For our opening hymn today, let's listen to hymn number 540 and follow along if you would like, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord. Listen to these words from Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on God's name. Make known God's deeds among the peoples. Sing to the Lord. Sing praises. Tell of all God's wonderful works. Glory in God's holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek the Lord's presence continually. Remember the wonderful works God has done, the miracles and judgments God has uttered. O offspring of Abraham, Jacob's servant, God's servant, children of Jacob, God's chosen ones. The Lord is our God, whose judgments are in all the earth. The Lord is mindful of his everlasting covenant, of the word commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant made with Abraham, his promise sworn to Isaac, and confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as your, as your portion for an inheritance. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, was suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let's prepare our hearts for prayer.
in the midst of all that is going on in our world, still we come to worship you this morning with joy and thanksgiving on our hearts, as we, which we express in the words of the psalmist, who told us, give thanks to the Lord, call on God's name, make known God's deeds among the people, sing to the Lord, sing praises, tell of all God's wonderful works, glory in God's holy name, and let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. And so we do come together to rejoice this morning, Lord. In spite of all that we see around us, we rejoice that you still are God. In spite of all the times when we have rebelled against you and when we have failed to follow your commands, you have forgiven us, and so we rejoice that you are God. In all of those times, we look around us and we are discouraged and we are uncertain about what the future might bring. Still, we know that nothing can separate us from your love, and so we rejoice and call upon you. Dear God, we thank you for this congregation, for this church that you have given us, and we thank you that every time we are in one another's presence, we also feel the presence of your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you will never, ever abandon your promise not to leave us or forsake us. And so at, at those times and in those occasions when it feels like we are alone, at those times when we are tempted to cry out with the words of Scripture, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We pray that we would still look at all of the ways in which you have shown yourself faithful and trustworthy in the past, and that you would remind us that we, you will continue to show yourself faithful and trustworthy in the present and in the future. And we thank you especially that you have shown yourself to be faithful to us in the sending of your son, Jesus Christ, who did not count equality with you as something to be exploited, but instead, gave himself up and became a servant and went to death for us, even death on a cross. We pray that we would look at the signs of life all around us and that we would read about your son in our scriptures and that we would remember this great gift of eternal life you have given us through him. We pray for those who are working for a cure for this illness that is keeping us apart so many times. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would guide their minds and their hands and show them a solution. And we pray that in this time all people might know that ultimately we trust on you and we rely on you and the future is in your hands and your hands alone. Forgive us for those times when we think that we can control the future and when we attempt to take control of the future in our hands and when it even begins to affect our relationships with others. Fill our hearts with trust. Fill our hearts with joy. Fill our hearts with hope. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Okay, if we have children here today, I see at least one, um, we'd like to invite them to come forward and Miss Pam is going to have our time with children. First thing I want you to do, you see what Mr. Uh, Preacher Craig's doing? He's gonna be videotaping this. Do you think you can stand up and look toward there? We're gonna blow Miss, Miss Joey a big old kiss. Can you stand up and face that? Stand up and face Preacher Craig. 
Okay. All right, I'm gonna say one, two, three. We're gonna blow this jug with a big old kiss. One, two, three. Mwah! See, she had an injury, so we gotta make her feel better. We missed her. All right, I got this box. Oh my goodness, is that not a great box? Something very, very, very important is inside of it. I'm gonna show you what it is. You ready? One, two, three. <gasps> Nothing. Oh, this is why we need Miss Joey. I must have forgot. Actually, there is something in inside. All right, so it's inside the box. It's outside the box. It's very important. We have to have it, and we breathe it. What is that? Air. Air. Yeah, air. Well, that's not what our Bible study uh, lesson is about today, but we, it is something very important. It's about learning about the kingdom of God. And so Jesus, one day, had a group of people around him, and, and he was trying to figure out a way to tell them about the kingdom of God. And so he liked to tell these little short stories, and one of them was about a mustard seed. Now, I'm going to let you hold on to this mustard seed. Do you think this little tiny, this is the tiniest seed you've ever seen in your life? Let me see if I can get one in my hand. It's so tiny. All right. I'm going to let you hold on to it. In fact, you can take those home and plant them. Do you think this little tiny seed, do you think that that would actually turn into a, a little small plant? Do you think it'd turn into a plant at all? Mm -hmm. Look at I think it would turn into a plant. You think it would? Actually, it grows into the biggest plant in the garden. It's the smallest seed, and it turns out to go like 10 feet tall. And its branches are out like this, and birds are landing on its branches, and making birds' nests. It's all from this little tiny seed. So, what we're going to be talking about is growing God's kingdom. That's the lesson we want to learn about. So, Jesus, when he was early in his ministry, he was going down the shore of Galilee. And he, and he came upon two fishermen, all right? Andrew and Peter, they were brothers. And they were casting their nets out and trying to catch fish. And he started talking about God's kingdom. And he said, follow me. And you know what? They left the, all, everything they owned behind to follow Jesus, to learn more about God's kingdom. And they went on down a little bit further on the shore of Galilee. And there were two more brothers, James and John. The same thing. Jesus started telling them about God's kingdom, the kingdom of God. And they wanted to learn more about this kingdom of God. And they left everything. They left their fishing nets. They left their fish. They left everything to follow Jesus. So next thing you know, Jesus has 12 disciples following him. And they're learning more and more about the kingdom of God. And then what happens is these 12 disciples, they go out all over by themselves to tell people about the kingdom of God. So it's just like this little, little seed growing up to this big plant that offers a lot of uh, opportunity for birds. And it's just like Jesus is, is teaching his disciples and the disciples have gone out and spread the word of God. And that's what he wants us to do. So if you have friends that maybe they don't know Jesus, you can tell them about Jesus. And that's helping the kingdom of God to grow. Does that make sense? Is that a good story? The mustard seed. So remember, this is a mustard seed. And when you plant those in Mimi's garden, let me come take a picture of them, okay? Okay. All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for all the blessings you give us, especially for helping us to teach others about the kingdom of God. These things we ask in your name. Amen. All right. Our Old Testament lesson today is from the book of... Uh, Genesis chapter 29, beginning with verse 15. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful. And beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban says, It said, It is better that I should give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. 
So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, This is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. Laban gave his maid Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her maid. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. He served Laban for another seven years. Our next hymn will be number 79, Holy God, we praise thy name. Listen to the gospel lesson today from Matthew chapter 13, uh, verses 31 to 33 and 44 to 52. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree 
so that the birds of the air come and make their nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they threw it ashore, sat down and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. We ask, O Lord, that through the reading of these words of Scripture and the proclamation of your word, we would hear with joy and thanksgiving what you say to us today. Amen. When I was uh, in college, I had the opportunity to, to take a trip to Europe, and during part of that time, I traveled in what was then known as East Germany. East Germany was behind the so-called Iron Curtain. It was part of the Soviet bloc. And I can assure you from being there that they ran their country a lot different than anything we've seen in the United States. The leaders of the country kept an iron fist on the people at all times. They controlled what they could do and when and where. The government controlled things like college admissions, things like what job you would do, pretty much told you what to do for most days of your life. Being a Christian was difficult there because with all of the control that the government had, they were able to force significant disadvantages on those who were believers, making it difficult for them to get better jobs and harder to gain admission to any of the universities. They also kept a very active military presence. Riding on a train through East German territory, we would often pass by these big parking lots that had, it seemed like, acres and acres and acres of military tanks waiting for the next invasion. Yes, life was difficult and it was a very powerful kingdom. And this kingdom of East Germany was answering to an even greater kingdom, the kingdom of the Soviet Union which controlled much of the part of the world at that time. There are still other places in our world where there are very powerful kingdoms, even if the communist bloc in Europe is no longer in existence. There are places like China where the government also has significant control over its people. Perhaps one of the reasons they've been able to stamp out the coronavirus is that people don't have freedom over there, and so they had the power simply to lock people into their houses. There also, people can face significant advantages or disadvantages when it comes to jobs or university admissions based on their public opinions and even based on their religious beliefs. Many of the believers in places like China have to try to worship in underground churches if they are not churches that are officially approved by the communist and atheistic government. Taking children to church these days in China is now illegal. That is how hard that this powerful kingdom of China is trying to stomp out religious belief. Christianity, though, has always attempted 
to coexist in the midst of powerful kingdoms. And that was just as true of the earliest believers who wrote our Gospels as it is today. Jesus came to a world, to his own people, the Jews, but they didn't have much control over their lives either. They were part of a great empire or a great kingdom that we know of today as the Roman Empire. Even though they were in Israel, the Roman Empire extended all the way up the Mediterranean coast and all the way across Turkey and Greece and all the way over as far as Rome. And Rome also tended to rule their territory with an iron fist. While they might not have been as abusive to all of their citizens as some powerful, efficient dictatorships are today, they also made life very difficult on people who refused to bow down in worship to the emperor. They also had enough power to collect taxes from all of the outlying nations that were part of their kingdom. They also had the power to force and pressure people into following the beliefs of Rome, particularly the belief that the emperor was at least semi-divine. And so Jesus' followers, the people that Jesus is preaching to, and these earliest believers in the Christian church also knew what it is like to live in a kingdom that is very, very powerful. It is interesting that given the kind of kingdom that these believers are used to, that Jesus would all throughout the Gospel of Matthew refer to his ministry as a kingdom as well. But as we'll see, his kingdom, the kingdom that was his ministry, was a very different kind of kingdom, for it is something that he always referred to as the kingdom of heaven. And so at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, when he first starts preaching in chapter 3, Jesus tells his people that they are supposed to repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And a short time later, Jesus says the same thing. And then sometime after that, after Jesus has gathered disciples for himself and sent them out to preach on his behalf, he tells them that they are to remind people of the same thing, that they too are to proclaim that the kingdom of heaven has come near. So here they are in the midst of a very powerful Roman kingdom, a kingdom that thinks that it is the most powerful kingdom on earth, and indeed it is. But yet Jesus has the temerity to call his own ministry a kingdom as well. And in fact, Jesus tells people that his kingdom is the kingdom that they are supposed to seek after, not the kingdoms of this world that seem so powerful. And so as part of his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus will tell people to strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness and these things, everything else that you need, will be given to you as well. Now, if Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, we might be tempted to think that Jesus has in mind power and authority and the ability to be a tyrant over the people just like the other kingdoms that we know of. But as we continue reading through the Gospel of Matthew and as we continue to listen to Jesus' teachings about the kingdom of God, we see that Jesus' kingdom is very, very different than any of the kingdoms of the world that we know about. The kingdoms of this world, of course, are very concerned about things like power, but also wealth and influence and reputation. But Jesus, on the other hand, tells the disciples that his kingdom is completely different. For instance, one time in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus and his disciples are walking along and Jesus realizes that his disciples are arguing with one another. They are arguing about who is going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus realizes once again that they still don't understand the kingdom of heaven, which after all makes sense because the kingdoms that they're used to are completely different. 
And so Jesus has to try to teach them again how his kingdom, how the kingdom of heaven is different when he tells them, I tell you that unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. You see, this kingdom that Jesus preaches, this kingdom of heaven, it's not like the kingdom of Rome. It's not like the kingdom of the Soviet Union or of East Germany or the kingdom of China. No, the kingdom that Jesus teaches is a kingdom that relies on something else for its influence in the world. And we see that this kingdom of heaven is also going to reject the importance of wealth. In fact, Jesus is going to go so far to, at one point as to say it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so with Jesus teaching about the kingdom of heaven, we realize that there are two very different kingdoms in the world, and Jesus tells his followers that they have a choice to make. You cannot follow the values of the kingdoms of the world with power and control and wealth and reputation, and at the same time enter into the kingdom of heaven, because you see the kingdom of heaven does not value those values at all. In fact, the kingdom of heaven rejects them. And so what it comes down to is the people that Jesus is preaching to have a choice to make. It is a choice between the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of heaven. We continue to realize the same thing in our own day and in our own time, don't we? Still today, 2,000 years later, Jesus invites us to make the same decision. Are we going to be part of the kingdom of this world or are we going to be part of the kingdom of heaven? Are we going to worship the earthly kings and rulers that we see on TV every day or are we going to worship the almighty God, the one that we find it too easy to forget about if we're not careful? The difference between the kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of heaven is always especially clear to me during an election year. And as we watch the television news shows and as we read about the news on the internet, we realize that the entire media, the entire world, the entire country are obsessed with the issue of who is going to lead the kingdom of this world. We talk like we are about to make the most important decision we will ever make about who is going to lead our kingdom, that it's the most important decision the American people will ever make, that their decision about who is going to lead this kingdom of the world is going to affect our lives and the life of the nation forever. And that might be the case, but yet the question of who is leading the kingdom of the world is still far, far less important. In fact, it is only child's play when compared to the issue and the question of whether you are going to follow the kingdom of heaven. No matter who is elected in our upcoming election, we can go on Facebook and we can snipe at one another about whether we are being patriotic enough and whether we are properly following the kingdom of this world, the kingdom that is based in Washington, D.C. But that's not the kingdom that we as believers are really part of, is it? No, the kingdom that we are part of is the kingdom that the world, most of the time, doesn't even see. The kingdom that has completely different values and completely different assumptions about what is important. The kingdom that has completely different goals for human life and a completely different end for human life. That kingdom is the kingdom of heaven. We are consumed and living in a kingdom that is concerned with things like financial security and reputation. However, we as believers are part of a kingdom established by a king who told us that it's easier for a man to go through the, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. 
what are some of the other ways around you that you are told each day that you should be a part of the kingdom of the world and that you can show your patriotism by being loyal to the ruler of this world when in fact there is only one king and he has a kingdom that is not of this world. It is this very kingdom, this kingdom of heaven, this kingdom that does not follow the assumptions of the world. This is the kingdom that Jesus is trying to teach about in some of the parables that he tells in today's reading from Matthew. Matthew chapter 13 is often referred to as the parable chapter. It is one of Jesus' five major sermons that he gives us in Matthew. It is the middle of the five major sermons, and it is full of parables designed to tell us about the kingdom of heaven. A couple of weeks ago, we read the kingdom of the farmer sowing seeds in the field and how this compares to the kingdom of heaven. And in today's reading, Jesus tells yet another parable about seeds that also illustrates the nature of this kingdom that we are part of and primarily citizens of. Jesus begins by telling his listeners that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in the field. He goes on to say that this mustard seed is a very small seed, the very smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and it becomes a tree so that the birds of the air can make nests in its branches. Some of you who have come to the, with the work crew on a Saturday morning to my house have probably know that I know very well how quickly a big bush can grow out of the smallest seed. You can practically look at the weeds on a hot summer day like this and see them rising out of the ground and you can see those bushes that I end up having to cut down on a regular basis because they grow so fast that I almost, and, and I forget about them and before I know it, they are almost trees. That's the image that Jesus is trying to present us with as he talks about the mustard seed growing into a large tree and comparing that to the kingdom of heaven. And then he offers a very similar second parable when he says the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. We know how just a teaspoon of yeast absent from an entire batch of bread can cause that bread to be flat and not rise at all. Once again, it takes just a tiny bit to make a tremendous difference. That's kind of the way the kingdom of heaven is also, isn't it? Like a seed in the ground or like a teaspoon of yeast mixed in with the bread dough, oftentimes the kingdom of heaven is something that is very difficult to see. It is something that is very difficult for the rest of the world to ignore. But thank goodness there have been plenty of people who have recognized what the kingdom of heaven can do. Plenty of people who have done the work of planting a mustard seed only to see the kingdom of heaven grow so large that nobody, not even the kingdom of the world, can ignore it any longer. Many years ago, there was a United, there was a young boy who would eventually become a Methodist and then a United Methodist, but he was a young boy who was in the Navy by the name of Ed Robb. Ed Robb has a wonderful autobiography about his life, which would eventually include being a Methodist evangelist and traveling around the country and leading many people to Christ. But early on in his life, he writes in his book, he was not living for Christ. Instead, he was trying to keep up with the drinking and the smoking and all the things that young people in the military try to do when they have their freedom and they're away from home and all of a sudden they don't have to go to church anymore. But he said as life went on, he realized that was not bringing him satisfaction. The kingdom of the world just wasn't doing it for him anymore. And one day after hearing an evangelist, he finally gave his heart to Christ once and for all and threw, he said, his cigarettes in the, in the trash can, which in those days was a sign of rebellion against God. And he said, 
his life was changed and eventually he would become a pastor and he would travel around the country, like I said, preaching the gospel to thousands and thousands of people all over our land. Ed Robb eventually had children and one of his sons, Ed Jr., because his dad had become part of the Christian faith, Ed Jr. was raised as a Christian and Ed Jr. felt the call to go into the ministry and so he did. And eventually, Ed Robb, after seminary, started a church, a church which he is still serving today, and a church which is one of the three or four largest churches in the United Methodist denomination. All of it having grown up from just a small group of people, in fact, from nothing during the lifetime of one pastor. And the reason Ed Jr. was able to do that is because his father, Ed Sr., had become a person of faith, one man becoming a person of faith, leading thousands of people in the world to Christ, producing a son who would in turn start a United Methodist congregation that today has 15,000 members, perhaps. I think that's what Jesus is talking about when he talks about the mustard seed. Nobody would have recognized anything about Ed or thought he was anything about significance of significance when he was just a young enlisted kid in the Navy. But eventually he proved to be that mustard seed that grew into such a tree that made clear to thousands of people that there is a different kingdom that we are to follow. Lupo Church is not located in a fast growing suburb of Houston like this church is. But think about the people that wander in and visit us from time to time. Think about the people we have cared for, the people that we have offered food to over the years because they come here hungry, the people that we have tried to connect up with different social service agencies, the children who no longer live with their own parents and live in a group home and have come to worship with us so many times. You see, those are mustard seeds as well. They are mustard seeds that most of the world doesn't recognize because the world does not live in the same kingdom that we live in. But while the rest of the world is out proclaiming the impressive nature of wealth and accomplishment and all of those things that are kingdom values and political power, and Republicans versus Democrats, those seeds that are being planted here are being served by a much greater kingdom when they are in this room. Are they not? As Jesus goes on to talk about the kingdom of heaven, he tells us not only that the kingdom of heaven is very small and given growth, fabulous growth by God, but he also goes on to tell us how valuable how precious is the kingdom of heaven. When he tells us that the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found hid, and then in joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought that field so he could have the pearl. You see, the kingdom of heaven is often hidden. The kingdom of heaven is often not obvious to us. It is like a treasure hidden in a field, but yet God has revealed to us where that treasure is. God has revealed to us that while the world is following the treasures of the world, we can follow the treasure that we know is hidden in the field, and that treasure is the kingdom of heaven. Years ago, when I was in graduate school, I knew a woman by the name of Martha. Martha was there working on a graduate degree, and she was very smart, and she wrote her final thesis, and it was snapped up by a publisher who published it as a book right away, and she received all kinds of accolades for what kind of a career she could have had as a college professor at a big famous college and written books and all those things that most of us can only dream about. 
But the reason she was going to graduate school was not so she could do that. The reason she was doing that was that she, so she could go back to the jungles of Papua New Guinea to continue to translate the Bible for people living in the jungle who had never known how to read or write, who had no electricity and no engines, to people who still hunted their food and fished their food in the ways that they have done for hundreds of thousands of years. And so at the end of that program, she went back and she continued, continued, continued to teach them how to read and write their own language and continued to help them translate the scriptures into their own language in a way that they could serve it best. And that's been her major life work. Not following the kingdom of the world, but instead finding a very valuable treasure in a field and giving up the kingdom of the world and everything else she could have so she can have that treasure of the kingdom of heaven that is hidden in the field. And so through, for one person moving from the United States to an island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, many, many, many people came to know the love and the salvation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It took a whole lifetime to translate the Bible into their language, which will continue to teach people the gospel for years. Brothers and sisters, we live in a different kingdom than the rest of the world lives in, don't we? We live in a kingdom that is like a mustard seed that most people don't see until it grows up and does fabulous things only through the power of God. Fabulous things on a large scale through thousands of people coming to Christ or fabulous things on a small scale through a few people coming to our church to hear the love of Jesus. We live in a kingdom that is often hidden, but yet it is a treasure in a field that we have found, isn't it? My challenge for you is to continue to ask how you can leave behind the kingdom of this world, leave behind the treasures of this world for the only kingdom that really matters, the kingdom that was started by the only true king. Let us pray. Oh God, it is a challenge living in the kingdom in which we live kingdom that is so visible all around us, a kingdom that uses social media and television to consume our lives. Teach us instead, O oh Lord, to look for that kingdom that is buried like a mustard seed, to look for that kingdom and find that kingdom and live in that kingdom that is buried like a treasure in a field. Teach us to give up all to have Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 405. Please open and follow along to this song. Seek ye first the kingdom of
following the benediction, you're welcome to dismiss by Rose, and I'll look forward to seeing you in the great outdoors where the viruses can dissipate before they get to us. Please uh, consider leaving your gift in the offering plate that will be in the narthex as well. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.